It was holiday time for me, and I was in New York. And as I strolled not far from my hotel, I was quite naturally attracted by the windows of Finland Hut Inn. Naturally, because these things of Finland are very dear to my heart. You see, I'm a Finn by birth. And these lamps, the glassware, the Aravia dishes, all were tied up with memories of my happy childhood in Finland. Nutty Yarvi glass. <laughs> I remember having broken just such a tray as this in a fit of temper. Almost my mother's heart and my father's hand. And then, visit Finland, a travel poster send. The country of 60,000 lakes, said another. Uh, I was born in Helsinki. Finland, night by air. What a delightful way to have a dream take wings. And what a pleasant place to say, I'm hungry, as a steward is serving us dinner. This food is excellent, I say. Our meal is served by Maxime of Paris, sir, says Eward. There was a note of pride in his voice, as indeed there should have been. It was really delicious. And later, I had a nightcap in the lounge downstairs. Imagine. 20,000 feet over the sea. And when I was ready to turn in, there was a big soft bed already prepared. Here I'm out over the Atlantic and missing none of the comforts of home. Actually, the comforts of two homes. One in New York, the other in Helsinki. I was going to bed not too far from one and would wake up not too far from the other. Incredible things. Yesterday, New York. This morning, far out over the Atlantic, some of my fellow passengers were having breakfast in Bend. And in just a few hours more, I was very young when I left Finland to become a citizen of the United States. But now something very warm and wonderful happened to me. Though I knew no one here, I felt that this too would be my home. That I would be in a land and among people that I loved. This is the city of my birth. Much here I might remember, yet a great deal would be new. There's the Helsinki Stadium, site of the 1952 Olympic Games. That surely was new, and in a sense, a symbol of an old vitality and a new international outlook. Manaheim Street. And here's my hotel, which I left almost immediately to get back on the streets again and among the people. There's the railroad station designed by Sorinen. Was it there when... Was I remembering what I had actually seen or seen only in pictures? I had seen so many pictures so often. Like the post office there around the corner on the left. Or the National Theater across the square. And Parliament Building that I know I remembered, for I'd gone there once with my school teacher. I even read all the name signs. Maybe some would strike a familiar chord. It was like looking for old friends in the passing crowd and almost finding them. The Great Church. This was more than a remembered building, for here I had come with my family and learned that our religion was not mere jumbled words in a church, but a way of life. There were statues everywhere. The Maid of Helsinki. The waiter, the shipwreck, symbolizing Finland's appeal for help some 50 years ago. Mother and child, no wonder the statues are called the beautiful ladies of Helsinki. And people going about their lives like people everywhere. But, but this was Helsinki. Even their new apartment houses seemed to me to have a special character that reflected the qualities of the people. They had strength, simplicity, beauty, and I am told there are none finer in all the world. Next day, my wanderings led me again to the great church, and from there on to the marketplace. 
Here, as in almost every land on Earth, you'll find a cross-section of the lives of the people. I thought being both Finnish and American that I knew something about seafood and fish. Till I went back to Finland. Time out for refreshment. But it was the flower market that really surprised and delighted me. When you consider that only 9% of all the land is cultivated, you know that here are people who love beauty and color and let nothing prevent them from getting their full share of both. You will take a boat across Helsinki Harbor and you will go to the Valhalla restaurant. That is what I had been told at Finland House when I had asked for the good places to dine in Helsinki. Imagine taking a boat to go to dinner. It was much more exciting than taking a taxi. In my case, of course, adventure was gastronomic rather than nautical. And the fact that the Valhalla restaurant had been converted from an old fort made it a sufficiently exciting objective. Here in what had once been a military gallery, visitors sit down to a full course dinner deliciously prepared, exquisitely served, and tell romantic stories about secret passageways and hidden treasure. After dinner, back on the mainland, we watched the dancing on the green. Young men and women of the community in native costume dancing the traditional folk dances of Finland. All over Finland, in summer camps like this one, they start early to learn the basic steps of folk dancing. The following day, I flew to Kuopio, the hub of East Central Finland, where I stopped at this lovely old inn. Here, some of the women in our party had their first experience with the sauna. These logs feed the fires of the sauna, the steam baths that are a national institution throughout Finland. Moistened birch leaves are used to stimulate blood circulation, part of a ritual that not only cleanses the body, but also purifies the spirit. After the sauna, a cold water dip, preferably in a beautiful lake like this, closes the pores opened by the heat. From Kuopio, I took a boat to Savonlina through the Saimaa chain of lakes, the main artery of eastern Finland. Much of the country's early history centered here where control of the waterways meant control of the land. This is the timber area. I was stirred by the magnitude of the logging and lumber operations. The gifts of nature in any land are the raw materials with which that nation builds its own way of life. And out of the things it makes are woven the fabric of its contacts with other nations all over the world. But most important is the character which these things build in its people. Not far away, I visited Olavenlina Castle, built in 1475 as a fortification against the east. The gateway to the lakes, it was once the scene of many turbulent battles. 
From there, we sail along Punkaharyu Ridge, winding for more than four miles, that's seven kilometers to the Finns, through the loveliest of the lake country. Remember that Nutta Yarvi glassware we saw at Finland House? Well, here's the plant where it was made. My next craft visit was to the internationally famous Arabia in Helsinki. For some 3,000 years, men have turned the potter's wheel. Here, ceramics has been raised to the level of high art. The factory is especially proud of its hand painting department in which some of the dishes are made primarily for export to the United States. I was told that the art department, founded in 1932, employs the talents of some 10 independent creative artists. Younger artists make small figurines by hand. And from here they travel all over the world to museums, gift shops, homes, taking beauty and color and gaiety along with them. A tourist traveling about Finland knows that wherever he goes, he will see a bit of his own country. For over all the hotels, as here at Hotel Alanko, fly the flags of the nations from which their guests have come. Nearby is the town of Hamelina, where Sibelius was born and went to school. Here's Hamelina Castle dating from the 13th century. My next stop was Tampere, which lies between two lakes. The rapids that connect the lakes are an excellent source of water power, and the area boasts 200 factories which make it one of the most important industrial centers in the nation. And not one plant or mill is unattractive. From Tampere, I went on to Turku, making a stop at the summer home of Finland's president. Turku is Finland's oldest town. It was founded in the 13th century, and at one time was the capital of the nation. An important import and export harbor, it buzzes with shipping and shipbuilding activity. Back in town, I visited Turku Cathedral, built in 1229. 
How different this 700-year-old structure is, I thought, from, well, the one at Rayamaki in South Finland, a fine example of the new trend in church architecture. Only a single block of wooden buildings survived Turku's great fire of 1819. It's now a handicraft museum. There in the early evening, I ran into some people who asked me to dinner. We dined on the crayfish these young people caught. At the table on the open terrace, we talked about what I'd seen and what I hadn't seen. Had I been to Lapland? No, but I'd been pretty close. Well, said my host, as others had before him, don't miss that province. So not many days later, I was in Lapland, where I stopped briefly at the Poyanavi Hotel in Ravia Niemi, the capital. Have you ever been served coffee and Danish pastry in a post office? I have. Ever send a having a wonderful time postcard stamped Arctic Circle? I did. Yes, I did both right here at a post office inaugurated by Eleanor Roosevelt in July 1950. I wasn't the only one who wanted to see the land of the midnight sun, the treeless fells, the reindeer, visitors from all over Finland and from all over the world, foot and by bus. For a native son of Finland, I knew very little about Finnish Lapland. I thought everyone lived in tents and did nothing but tend reindeer. I found I was wrong. The nomadic Laplanders move across Finland, Sweden, and Norway without much regard for citizenship, and the countries don't bother them. One thing about reindeer, they can't be pushed around like cattle. Ask a Laplander when he's going to get some work done with these animals, and he'll tell you, when the reindeer are ready, This woman is wearing an old-fashioned costume whose skirt bands represent the colors of the Aurora Borealis. These are hardy people, and out of their limited materials, they have built a way of life suited to their needs. Never ask a Laplander how many reindeer he owns. It's like asking your suburban neighbor how much money he has in the bank. But he is an easy host with whatever he has, and sometimes his possessions will surprise you. It was June 23rd, the time for the Midsummer Festival. I flew south again to watch the festivities. Across the land, bonfires are lit and kept burning throughout the night, as they were in pagan days, to ward off evil spirits or send greetings. Everyone, young and old, joins in the dance. It's festival time, too, in the Timberlands. Here, skill and strength compete with injury, even death. There's no more hazardous sport than this in all the world. Many are hurt, some are killed, but the competition goes on year after year. The visitors, too, may have an exciting ride for them. These boats are far safer than logs, but there's plenty of thrill in the nine miles of rapids in Suomasalmi. My sports mood was climaxed a few nights later when just before I left for home, I went to a track meet at the Helsinki Stadium, scene of the 1952 Olympic Games. It was evening when I came to the stadium, yet it was still daylight. I was part of a huge crowd that filled the stands to capacity. As I watched the runners racing around the track, I thought of the greatest runner of them all, Pavo Nurmi, who carried the glory of Finnish athletes across the world. For me, this was no mere sports exhibition. It was a symbol of a nation devoted to its youth, enjoying the delights and rewards of courage and sportsmanship. Even the crowd had a special thrill for me. From every part of Finland, these people had come, come to cheer their heroes, 
come the glory and the qualities that had made them a proud nation. And from every part of the world had come thousands of attracted by the beauties and traditions of the land and of the people. This was a thrilling climax for a wonderful trip. And for myself, and for the thousands of others like me, I felt a deep gratitude for the miracle of air travel that had made this trip possible.